You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Today is going to be a lot of fun because I'm interviewing um, a dear friend and a fantastic human being who's moved the needle on our awareness for health in much of his career, uh, Dr. David Perlmutter. He's been on the show several times and is one of those guys who's connected the gut and the brain and how we treat kids, how we treat ourselves for decades of writing books. So one of the one of the greats and someone I've uh, recorded an interview on his boat, uh, tends to be in my part of the world some of the year. So uh, it's always good to get to interview him because he knows stuff that no one else does. And in our interview today, we're going to talk about what I think might be the next big biomarker. You've already learned about levels health and what you can do with continuous glucose monitoring. You've learned about ketone monitoring, all the different ways you can do that. But do you know your uric acid levels? You probably don't, but it turns out there's equipment and there's reasons to measure this. So what you're going to learn, as I promised you this year, I'm going to tell you exactly why to listen to a show before the show so you know that it's a good idea to listen to it, or you could say, I just don't care. So you're going to learn in this one from one of the great uh, functional medicine doctors out there, what uric acid does to you, why it's a key health marker and a major indicator of whether you are getting chronic degenerative diseases. And this is true at any age. If I had known this when I was 20, it would have changed everything and it probably would have saved me a million dollars later. So in the show, you'll learn how to measure your uric acid levels, what they mean, and you'll also learn about a new book that has the best name of a book I've seen in a long time, and it's called Drop Acid, (laughs) which is like the best, most kind of creatively naughty, uh, yet completely accurate title ever. So Dr. Perlmutter, my friend, welcome back to the show, and thanks for a hilarious book title. (laughs) Oh, thank you. It's, uh, as we were saying before uh, we went on, just great to see each other. So what you've done in Drop Acid is, is identified, okay, Um, There is a level of something that medicine has looked at for a specific condition and said, oh, wow, fluctuations in that level tell you all sorts of things, including an early indicator for diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and Alzheimer's. Those are the big four killers from my anti-aging book. Those are the things that take out most of us. You have to take care of those if you're going to live a very long time. Like, first, don't die so you can live a long time. It's not, you know, the the number one cause of death isn't a virus or anything infectious. It is uh, a consequence of our disrupted lifestyle. And it really, uh, the history of this uh, mismatch, if you will, between our our genes and our current environment, or what we call evolutionary environmental mismatch, goes back as it relates to uric acid and the metabolic issues that we're suffering from. This can be traced back to about 15 million years ago during the middle Miocene period when the earth became cooler and there was a strong selection pressure on our primate ancestors favoring those who had whatever genetic mutations might let them make a little bit more fat, make a little bit more blood sugar to power their brains and they would survive and pass those genes on to the following uh, generations and that happened all the way to us and we've identified that there was a suite of genes in mutations that took place over more than a million years in an enzyme called uricase that breaks down, as you would guess, uric acid, such that these primate ancestors lost the ability to break down uricase, so their uric acid levels were higher, and that provided a signal in their bodies that food was scarce. Make fat, store fat, raise the blood pressure, raise the blood sugar, and we inherited that thrifty genome even to this day. It was helpful for our hunter-gatherer forebears because they might not know when their next meal was coming. But, you know, ever since agriculture and certainly a lot more recently, we've been kind of targeting that whole mechanism to make body fat and store it. And now uh, we have this mismatch whereby fructose, which is the signal, fructose, fruit sugar, becomes uric acid in your body, in my body, in the bodies of everybody on the planet. And that's a signal saying that we've got uh, food scarcity is coming. We better make fat. So now that we understand that, we can target uric acid. You can measure it at home. Uh, You can get your doctor to measure it. And then we can lower it. And that is turning out to be a really powerful player to rein in a whole suite of metabolic issues. 
All right. This sounds really promising for all the biohackers out there. And also, you might not be a biohacker. You might just say, well, I have this weight that won't go away, and I'm tired of going to the gym all the time and it not moving, and I'm tired of trying a keto diet and it not moving and saying something's wrong. Well, this is an early indicator. Uh, so we can incorporate this. And what you brought to my attention uh, when a box arrived and I opened it up and it says, you know, drop acid and there's uh, a <laughs> What did you expect of, would be in that box? Oh, I mean, coming from you, you never know. Right? But it was uh, vinyl Hendrix albums, first of all. <laughs> exactly. I, I dug through those, the tie dye. No. A tie dye uh, shirt, it, right. <laughs> it didn't just have a copy of your new book in it. It had a, a meter. Right. Uh, one of these meters, um, which measures uric acid from a little blood stick, same as you would with an older blood sugar meter if you don't have the continuous glucose ones, um, or you would with a keto meter. So it turns out a little tiny prick on the finger really, really helps. And uh, first off, okay, you sent me one, uh, thank you, but what does a meter like this normally run? Uh, I think they're about ninety dollars, or be, somewhere between eighty and ninety dollars, and okay. uh, and I think they come with twenty sticks to measure. Uh, and the good, you know, unlike measuring your blood sugar every day for people who don't have a CGM, uh, this is something you do every two to four weeks because it's not going to vary that quickly. It it depending on, of course, how aggressive you are about lowering it. But the nice thing is it records. I don't know if you're able to see that. That was my most recent measurement, four point seven. But it, okay. it it will record your history of measurements and uh, allow you to uh, see what the impact is of your change in lifestyle, which is what it's all about. I mean, it's why we wear you know a wearable devices to track our sleep, to track our blood sugar, because once we know where we are, we can observe how our lifestyle changes affect those parameters. And now we have a new parameter to to look at, which is measuring our uric acid. Okay. And I just want to say that. Um, you know, here in the United States, we're, we're kind of a little behind other countries. For example, Japan has been studying this and, and really actually intervening with patients who have elevated uh, uric acid and other metabolic problems uh, for decades, for at least a couple of decades. They put out a, a really fascinating study back in 2009 where they followed uh, a group of individuals, 90,000 people, adults, 42,000 men, 48,000 women, they followed them for eight years. They measured their uric acid at the beginning of the study, and they found that with people who had a level of seven, which is very common or greater, their risk of what we call all-cause mortality, meaning dying from anything whatsoever, was increased by 16%. Their risk of death from cardiovascular uh, issues was increased by 39%. Risk of death from stroke increased by 35%. And what I found really fascinating was that for every point elevation above seven, there was an additional eight to 13% increased risk of death from, again, what's called all cause mortality, meaning you died from something. So, you know, this is a big study, went on for a long time. That's compelling information, especially now that we know that uric acid is signaling our bodies, it's sending an alarm signal to our entire body saying winter is coming. And, uh, this, and it's telling our bodies, get ready, uh, re reduce your metabolism so it compromises mitochondrial function, make body fat, lock up the body fat, store it so you can't tap into it, uh, and even raise your blood sugar so you can do what? power your brain so you can avoid two things. You can avoid starvation and you can avoid predation, meaning getting eaten by another animal. We, you know, we have a, a pretty sizable brain. We need to power it. So this is a signal then that's telling us to get ready. And uh, it, it's very interesting because what it does, uh, and I think many of your uh, viewers, especially those who really consider them kind of deeply in, entrenched in the biochemistry, what uric acid does is it shuts off AMP kinase. And I, I'm certain that many of your listeners, viewers know that we want AMP kinase pathway lit up all the time because- Which, that, which is why coffee, right? Why coffee, why exercise, how <laughs> metformin works to keep diabetics, blood sugars lower, uh, quercetin, uh, berberine, lots of things we could do to, to keep our AMP kinase lit up. Because when uric acid is elevated, it shuts that down and it tells us 
Don't burn your body fat, store your body fat. It actually shifts this all meta whole metabolism over to another way of dealing with AMP, and that's through what's called AMP deaminase. And this is exactly the shift that happens, for example, in bears prior to their hibernation. They're trying to make as much body fat as they possibly can and ratchet down their metabolism so they could live in the cave for however many months. And, and they need to make this body fat during the fall when they're eating the fructose, eating the berries. So unless you know any of your viewers think they're going to hibernate for several months, it's not what we need to do. We want to be burning our body fat. We want to be keeping AMP kinase active, keeping our blood sugar lower. And I think you mentioned something uh, a moment ago. I think it was really very important about people who are struggling with their blood sugars, their blood pressures, their body weight, doing all the things, right? They're listening to every podcast, trying to do their best, whether it's keto or paleo or whatever, but they're sticking to these plans and maybe making progress, but they're always wondering if there just isn't something missing. Some other little piece of the puzzle, that little corner piece in the jigsaw puzzle, puzzle that when you get it, you go, yeah, finally. And I would submit that for many people, it's going to be targeting specifically, and we'll talk about it, their uric acid. I have to say, uh, having looked through your book uh, and having just chatted with you about this, I wish that I had included this in Superhuman because the percentage risk of lowering of all-cause mortality, it's a major thing you do when you're looking to live a long time. And the percentages that you cited there are very meaningful. I, I went through many, many interventions and they're saying, okay, this one looks like it works for this, this one looks like it works for this. But uric acid as a signaling molecule is right. something that a lot of people haven't talked about. So maybe this came out of Japan or something, but how come you're the first person in the West who's talked about this? It, it seems like it's a big enough thing. We I'm should not, all be talking about it. I'm absolutely yeah. not. Uh, I, you'll note that uh, drop acid, which is something I think we should all do um, in the <laughs> context of uric acid, uh, is dedicated to a man named Richard Johnson, MD. Okay. Dr. Richard Johnson, University of Colorado. Um, he, he's done the pioneering work and really began to raise the, the level of understanding of uric acid's role. But uh, again, this is something that's not uncommon in many other countries around the world. In America, it's all about you know, lowering your cholesterol and hope for the best. You know, We really see that the mentality here in, in uh, North America is kind of live your life however the heck you want. And when you're finally cognitively impaired, your blood sugar is going through the roof or whatever it is, We'll fix it for you. Don't worry. Pharmacy is here. You know, main, mainstream pharmaceuticals are here to save the day. That is just a, a perversion of reality, especially as it relates to the brain. And, you know, that's what really got me started uh, when I reviewed studies like a, a Japanese uh, study looking at 1,600 people and followed them for 12 years. Uh, and every two years, they did an assessment of how well their brains were working. And what they found was after the 12 years, those who had the higher levels of uric acid above seven, uh, they experienced an 80% increased risk of developing dementia, a 55% increased risk of developing specifically Alzheimer's disease. Oh, did I say a disease for which there is no treatment? And they had a 166% increased risk of what is called mixed or vascular dementia. Now, you know, I'm a neurologist and in dealing with these problems, from a interventional pharmaceutical perspective, there's very little. If, uh, from a pharmaceutical perspective, there's really nothing yet that we have that can arrest this problem. It's very, very challenging. And it gets me both from my you know, professional perspective and from a personal perspective, having dealt with this in my dad as well. So anything that we can do that has an impact like that, I think is very, very valuable. But you know, the thing about this, metabolic signaling is it has huge impacts on cardiovascular disease, on hypertension. We mentioned Alzheimer's and even uh, various forms of cancer like pancreatic, colon, and breast cancers that are related to this metabolic mayhem and that's being being kind. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a new and very exciting tool. And the, the exciting thing about it is it's something that uh, we could take home. 
You know, it's not like you have to have your, you know, your genome sequence and send it off someplace and hope that you get back an interesting interpretation uh, that might or might not be effective for you. This is really very, very straightforward. All right. Everyone in the Upgrade Collective, and if you're listening to the show, Upgrade Collective is my membership and mentorship group. And we've got a bunch of people in our live audience in a real active chat thread, uh, all making jokes about acid and at the same time going, come on, what do we do to lower it? But first, I want to know, what do we do to raise it? What are the things that are cranking this up in people? So for many years, uh, people have known that elevated uric acid can be a problem generally in the context of something called gout, where you develop mm -hmm. painful crystals that accumulate in your great toe. And it, uh, it's traditionally been described as the king of diseases and the disease of kings, meaning people who ate a lot of rich food, a lot of food rich in what are called purines. That's a lot of uh, meat, but specifically organ meats, liver and kidney. Uh, and it turns out that while those can relate uh, in our modern world, the big player is fructose or fruit sugar. Not necessarily the fruit sugar found in an apple, but the fructose that's found in soda, added to sauces, actually you know, found in more than 60% of packaged foods in the, the grocery store. Things like fruit juice, for example. That There's nothing natural about fruit juice. The fructose content will knock your socks off. Fructose is metabolized directly into uric acid. There are only three things that make uric acid, alcohol, purines that I mentioned earlier, uh, and fructose. And so when you see, for example, a combination uh, drink uh, that has both high purines and alcohol, which is beer made from yeast, so it's got a lot of purines, then we begin to understand why people get a beer belly because it's telling the body aggressively through two in inputs, purines and fructo and alcohol rather, make fat because winter is coming. And be, you know, gaining body fat and raising your blood sugar and your blood pressure are terrific things. They're wonderful things for 99% of the time on, our, on this planet, but not now. So until just recently, if you could make a little more body fat, you would survive because you had that backup resource for calories so that if there was no food, you might make it through, whereas the next person uh, might not. And this, again, we call this the evolutionary environmental mismatch. And I actually wrote my first paper on uh, this whole concept of environmental mismatch uh, 50 years ago, a uh, half a century ago, uh, published that in the um, Miami Herald in 1971. I was 16 at the time. And I concluded that uh, paper by uh, uh, op-ed by saying, but what about us living today with the outdated machinery? Meaning we have machinery that's really set up for the hunter-gatherer times or even you know prior to that when the world was a different place. And what I'm saying is if we can emulate those signals to our DNA and our physiology that have evolved to keep us healthy, we're going a long way to offsetting these incredibly powerful metabolic uh, disruptions that are paving the way for, as we talked about earlier, the, the biggest cause of disease on our planet. And you know, to be clear, this uric acid is screaming, winter's coming, make fat. And and also uh, important to, to recognize that it raises our blood pressure because it's a signal that we're facing dehydration. Now, that's a little bit more complicated, but understand, let me preface this by, let's, let's think about a camel. And a camel is getting ready to walk, it is walking across the desert. It's not drinking water uh, for three weeks and it has this great big hump. What do you think's inside that hump? Not water, fat. Because when we burn body fat, we create two things, carbon dioxide and what's called metabolic water. water. <laughs> so fat is a powerful resource for us as humans. Yes, as a resource for calories, we get that. But also a hedge against dehydration because it, when we burn that fat, we're making metabolic water. So it turns out that when our bodies think we're dehydrated, we turn on fat production. And why do we think we're dehydrated? Well, we might be dehydrated if we're not drinking enough water, but we can also signal that by 
raising our sodium. When, when we don't have enough water to drink, our, our sodium level goes up, and that turns on a pathway whereby our bodies make fructose. Then that fructose becomes uric acid, and what happens? Our blood pressure goes up. We make fat so we can make metabolic water. How do you raise your sodium? Well, either with the playoffs or the Super Bowl, you park yourself on that couch and eat that bag of pretzels with a lot of salt, and your serum sodium goes up. You start making fructose, making uric acid, making body fat, and the next thing you know, you're signaling this entire alarm cascade, in this case, say, thinking that your body's becoming dehydrated and, and it's trying to protect itself. Okay. A couple of questions for you there. Low sodium diets make people feel like crap and raise risk of heart disease. The current levels that the RDA has for sodium, for total sodium, raise levels of renin in the blood enough that it increases your, very substantially, your risk of cardiovascular disease. Higher stress means higher demand for sodium. And from many of the things I've seen, you get enough sodium. And for me, it's about six grams a day, roughly three right. times more than the RDA. Uh, then I have a clearer head. I make stomach acid better, uh, increases in bone density. Like, oh, there's all this good stuff from salt. And then we've got guys like uh, Paul Saladino and Liver King and me. I've been recommending raw liver since my first book on fertility, yet it's high in purines. So how do we how do we look at that? If, I don't want people to lower salt because they're going to feel like crap if they do and they no, won't handle and, it. No, uh, and let me, let first uh, tackle the salt question and we'll get yeah. back to the liver. Uh, and first, uh, the important thing about salt consumption is that yes, you're right. We do need some sodium. Uh, but there are two things that are extremely important, and that is the rate that we consume it and the concentration uh, by which we consume it. So uh, if a person's eating a salty food uh, that is going to give them sodium, which has, as you mentioned, some uh, retrospective studies indicating that there, there, there are benefits, and we know we need serum sodium uh, you know, to be balanced, the, the trick is to follow it with water. And therefore, okay. your sodium level isn't going to change. So you're right. But eating just salt in and of itself tells the body to make fat. I mean, this is something that uh, mm. cattle ranchers have known okay. for a long time. Why do you think they put a salt lick and out so the, the cattle are going to lick salt all day long because it's making them, your physiology thinks it's dehydrating and they increase their fructose production and make body fat. Now, as it relates to liver, which has huge pro properties that are healthful, the B12 uh, availability, iron availability, et cetera, it's really all about the individual. I would say that the biggest uh, issue, by far and away, isn't eating high purine foods. It's yeah, always been the fructose. Even there you go. in the day of gout, it was always the fructose. Back in the 1800s, uh, the amount of sugar consumption in England was actually quite substantial, especially in, its, in being mixed with alcohol. Then okay. you, add, you layer on top of that the purines, and to this day, and we can speculate, we don't need to speculate, we, we know why. To this day, when you look at a diet for gout or a diet to lower uric acid, go online, go to one of the institutions, their websites, it's all about lowering purines. And they're so loath to talk about sugar. It's the mm -hmm. sugar. It is there you clearly go. the sugar. Whether you want to talk to Nina Teicholz or Robert Lustig uh, or you know any of these people who are trying to get this message out, Casey Means, it's mm -hmm. all about the sugar. And yet, oh, no, no, you need to stop eating liver. You need to stop eating um, organ meats and venison and, and uh, scallops and mussels. Really, as it relates to uric acid, by far and away, it's the fructose. That's so, the when, thing that increased 1,000% in American uh, adults' consumption going from 1970 to 1990. In order, then, the things that are going to raise your uric acid the most would be, number one is sugar or well, let me the top five. fructose, then number alcohol, one then fructose. liver. Number two okay. is fructose. Number three is fructose. <laughs> <laughs> number four, purines. Number five, alcohol. And I don't oh, are purines really worse than alcohol? Really? It's alcohol and purines. Uh, I don't know if the order is right. It really depends on the individual. Okay, so, fair point. Alcohol needs a little bit of, uh, uh, we need to double click on that for just a moment because wine, it turns out, doesn't really have much of an effect uh, because wine has offsets. Like fruit has offsets. You can eat fruit. Uh, wine has offsets, probably the bioflavonoids that target an enzyme that makes uric acid. So in women, 
uh, retrospective food fe- uh, frequency questionnaire studies demonstrate that women who drink wine have a slightly lower uric acid than those who do not. Men, it's about a wash. It's about neutral. Hard liquor is associated with a slight raised uh, uric acid level. But as I mentioned before, beer beer is you know a big issue because of the alcohol, yes, but also the purines. And once again, Japan is ahead of us on this by creating and marketing purine-free beer. Wow. And I can assure you, in Japan, uh, this is well beyond the, the small percentage of their population that has gout. They recognize that purines make uric acid, which leads to high blood pressure, which leads to high blood sugar and obesity. So now you find purine-free, purine-free beer. Wow. I did not know they did that. Why does Japan do so many of these cool things that we don't hear about here for many years? Well, I think they got into trouble earlier than we did. Uh, J- Japanese people tend to eat a lot of umami flavored foods. Umami flavored umami foods are um, are going to be very very high in purines, and so they they have a risk for high uric acid, uh, and you know have been dealing with this actually for quite some time, and then began to study. Well, what is it? What else may be going on? What are the correlates that we're seeing? Uh, with high uric acid, and they began to unravel uh, and re- reveal to the rest of the world these um, really high relationships with various uh, metabolic diseases. One study published, I think, 2016 by both uh, Japanese and Turkish researchers uh, is entitled Uric Acid in Metabolic Syndrome from an Innocent Bystander to a Central Player, meaning, yeah. We've known that there's elevated uric acid uh, that correlates with obesity, diabetes, hypertension. We've known that for a long time. But that study really made it clear that it's not just happens to be elevated in conjunction with these issues. It's causing it. It's playing a role with lots of research. I delineated it in the book showing that when you intervene and stop uric acid production and don't even make a dietary change, uh, that you can reduce hypertension, you can reduce weight gain. Uh, wow. And in, in some of these studies, they actually raise the uric acid by giving humans what? Fructose, p- placing them on a high fructose diet. But, you know, frankly, you don't need to even do that. When you see the amount of fructose that uh, adolescents and young adults are consuming these days in the form of, of uh, energy drinks and sports drinks, along with soda and fruit drinks, uh, it's it's breathtaking, and it's no wonder that uric acid levels, which were averaging about 3.5 in America in the 1920s, now are averaging 6.0 in American adults. And that increase is in lockstep with our increase in fructose consumption. So, you know, there have been uh, variations in alcohol consumption, certainly going through prohibition, et cetera, uh, and purine consumption as, you know, more people adopt a plant-based diet. But what we're seeing is still uric acid levels are skyrocketing. It's been estimated, right now we know that in America, one third of adults isn't just overweight, but is obese. A third yeah. of American adults is obese. And in the distant future, in 2030, that's way in the future, some distant future, that number is going to be 50%, the flip of a coin. Obese, not just overweight. Right now, more than 70% of Americans is either obese or hypertend- or uh, or overweight. And this isn't that there's been a sudden change in our genome. It's an environmental issue. It's really based upon our choices that are so heavily influenced uh, by industry. I, I have a question for you. This comes from the Upgrade Collective. Um, there are a variety of what's called biogenic amines. And these are things that are formed in the gut, and purines are one of them. But uh, so is spermidine. There's putrescine, and uh, which strangely enough has benefits and negatives. But are the are all of these going to raise uric acid? No, I mean these are metabolites uh, uh, there from. So they're they're not. And these are actually you know uh, uh, created to some degree by our microflora, by the by right. the gut bacteria. But uh, you know having that does kind of segue nicely though. Uh, into the notion that there's an interplay then between uric acid and our gut bacteria, uh, such that higher levels of uric acid favor more uh, or the what are called the pro-inflammatory 
uh, bacteria. And, you know, I always want to break it down and say, oh, that sounds terrible. We don't want more inflammation. That's always bad. No, uh, diabetes isn't always bad. Uh, body fat uh, retention isn't always bad. It could be a life-saving situation. Let's look at it in context. So, um, having an increased amount of inflammation can be life-saving and would have been life-saving for our ancestors in helping them deal with various types of infection. Inflammation is an important life-saving mechanism within your physiology. So the notion that a higher level of uric acid by increasing inflammation and increasing gut permeability might have an upside, I think it, you know, it just changes our perspective a little bit. Similarly, the APOE4 genetic allele is associated with increased risk for Alzheimer's. So obviously under any circumstance, it's a bad thing, right? Well, no. Uh, we know that in certain cultures uh, that are equatorial and uh, live in a, in a very uh, agrarian or a hunter-gatherer-like environment, carrying the APOE4 allele that we used to call the Alzheimer's gene is actually associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's and certainly a better ability to combat certain infections, specifically parasitic infections. So getting back to the uric acid relationship to the uh, microflora, we know that, for example, uh, gout can be treated uh, with what is called a fecal transplant. By giving gout sufferers normal gut bacteria in the form of a fecal transplant, we've talked about it before, their frequency of gout attacks goes down. So it's it's a two-way street. And, and again, uh, hey, the various things that uric acid can do in your body uh, are, are generally in the context of our modern world where it's 365 days a year that we're signaling our bodies to get ready for winter, make fat, raise the blood sugar, raise the blood pressure. Uh, you know, we have to think of it in the context of, gosh, for our ancestors, that was life-saving. And that's why we're in this situation today, whereby everyone walking the planet has inherited this uricase mutation. Wonderful uh, review about this in Scientific American about how this all happened. And therefore, when we come upon uh, the blueberries uh, in the late fall and early, uh, late, late summer and early fall, and it signals our body to make fat, well, that might have been great for our hunter gatherer forebears, but for you and me, who have access to fructose 365 days a year, it's sending the signal, oh my gosh, you're not gonna have food, winter's coming, uh, and it doesn't work for us. This is one of those things about eating seasonally. Uh, if you do that, you're supposed to fatten up in summer, and towards the end of summer, you would eat more omega-6 fats because there are more of them available, which slow down your metabolism, exactly. make you tired, and put you into hibernation. Uh, that's why bears do it. it, it it's, it's designed that way. But if we don't want to put on fat all summer long <laughs> and then go through a winter without carbs where our brains are slow and we're tired, you might want to eat seasonally, but maybe you don't need to load up quite as heavily, even on fruit towards the end of summer when it's available. Yeah, and I would say if not just eat seasonally, but if you're planning to eat seasonally, in other words, load, not loading up, but eating more of those fructose-rich carbohydrates in the late summer, early fall, you've got to be all in on the entire rest of the plant, meaning that once winter comes, uh, your body should experience uh, fasting and, or, or at least, <laughs> at the very least, time-restricted eating. So it's, it's not and really darkness. fair to stick and choose from the, uh, from the paleo menu and say, I'm going to do part of it, but not all of it, because it's either, you know, it's a whole program. If you're going to emulate our ancestors, then you need to go to bed when it's dark. You need to have, you know, high quality sleep. And, um, and every aspect of what we assume our Paleolithic ancestors experienced. Okay, I'm, I'm getting you there. And this is a way of monitoring. If you get your measures every two, every four weeks, you can see if what you're doing to probably just reduce your fructose, which you and I have been recommending for at least 10 years in, in the books that we write and all. Um, but there are other markers that matter. Now, I'm going to ask you this as an MD, as a neurologist. If you had a random person from the population out there, you, you don't know much about them, and you wanted a marker to predict, if you got COVID, would you be hospitalized? 
and you could either get their vitamin D level or you could get their uric acid level, which one of those markers is likely to be more important? Hard to say. Um, you know, we, we've seen the data on vitamin D uh, and we've seen the data on uh, uh, blood sugar upon entrance. I think that uh, w- one of the most powerful tools for predicting outcome is called a tape measure around the world. <laughs> wow. Very sophisticated. But as wow. they have it in May of 2021, a study came out. Uh, Chinese researchers actually looked at 1,854 people and measured their uric acid when they presented to the hospital. And what they found was really quite interesting, that the risk of being uh, one of three things, going in the ICU, being put on a ventilator, or death. And all three is what they called the composite score. But the risk of these things was between two and three times increased if you entered the hospital with a high uric acid level. So uh, why would that, that, that shouldn't be a surprise because that uric acid level is going to be seen in people with diabetes and with a hypertension and certainly with a high body mass index or, or obesity. So it does have an effect on immune function. It does, uh, I think we're just beginning to see how it relates to inflammation like we, we talked about a, a little while ago. But you know, uh, again, there are interventional studies being done now where pharmaceuticals are used to lower uric acid and, they're, and, and we're seeing results in terms of things like a body fat and blood pressure. How the pharmaceuticals work, like allopurinol, which is a gout drug, is it targets a specific enzyme called xanthine oxidase, that'll be on the quiz, that's fundamental in the production of uric acid. Well, it turns out that that xanthine oxidase is dramatically inhibited by some exotic thing called quercetin. Who knew? Quercetin and, and luteolin, another bioflavonoid available at the health food store, target this xanthine oxidase enzyme almost as effectively as the drug. Uh, and so we see studies, one study uh, in, uh, from Oxford in British literature showed that giving uh, quercetin 500 milligrams a day in a group of 22 uh, young men with elevated uric acid lowered their uric acid by 8% in two weeks. No other changes, just quercetin. And, you know, we mentioned it earlier, <laughs> quercetin powerfully targets AMP kinase. Who wouldn't want that? It's a senolytic. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's an antioxidant. So I'm all in as it relates to taking 500 milligrams of quercetin. I, I've been doing that for quite some time, along with 100 milligrams of luteolin. Wow. Luteolin it's and strong, quercetin, right? Strong medicine. It really, really is. I mean, right, right. Just those two nuggets, I, I think, uh, for your viewers, going to have a, a really significant effect on lowering their uric acid. And you know, uh, you were alluding to the fact that you know you do ha- have friends uh, who are all in as it relates to things like eating organ meats, for example. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I'm not saying be- even though there are higher in purines. Do you necessarily have to go on a program that eliminates them? You do not, depending on your uric acid level. But let's say you do your best to eliminate the fructose, you're taking the quercetin, you're monitoring your sleep, you're doing all the right things, and it's still a little bit recalcitrant. It's not reaching 5.5. That's the number. That's our goal. It's still around 6. That's better, but not good enough. Then that person may want to maybe cut back a little bit on the purine rich uh, animal foods and see what happens. But I think the again, third time I've said it, the big player is the fructose. Add in the quercetin, add in some luteolin, uh, and, and certainly, uh, I think that generally in most people they're going to see a pretty dramatic lowering of the danger signal screaming in your body, uh, telling you to make fat and store fat. Now I got curious as we were talking about specific types of probiotics that produce uricase, which breaks down uric acid. What's your take on probiotics for this? Well, I, I don't think there, there's really uh, much in the way of marketed- uh, Nothing marketed. No. Mo- uh, probiotics that do in fact supply uricase. Uh, again, to remind everybody, the uricase is the enzyme that in other mammals, for example, uh, breaks down uric acid to allantoin. 
Uh, we don't have uricase. We have really zero as it relates to uh, uricase enzymes, so we don't have that, nor do the great, any of the great apes, the orangutans, uh, for example. All, all of us have uh, elevated uric acid four to five times higher than that of other mammals because it was a good thing. It was a good thing for us to become insulin resistant. Think about it. You know, we're always castigating insulin resistance and all those things. You know, you can put, whether it's talking to Gary Tobbs or, or mm -hmm. uh, Bob, Rob Lustig, whoever, and that's in the context of our modern world. But, you know, again, a survival mechanism. Uh, but, but that said, uh, I think we're going to see it. I think more importantly, what we're going to see will be targeting an enzyme called fructokinase. And that is the, that's step one. Uh, it's so it's so interesting. That's step one in the changing of fructose through several other uh, intermediates into uric acid. If we can inhibit fructokinase, that will be the home run. There are uh, a group of people who have fructokinase uh, inherited deficiency, and they develop a disease called fructose urea, where their ur urine is full of fructose because they can't metabolize it. They can eat sugar all day long. Uh, they don't gain weight. They don't develop any metabolic issues. So uh, there's a lot being done to look at what would happen if we inhibited uh, fructokinase. Um, wow. So there's a there's a whole a whole pack of pharmaceutical or lifestyle things to do that. I want to make sure that listeners, because I'm seeing questions from the Upgrade Collective, so anyone listening to this, luteolin, L U T E O L I N. One hundred. Um, I do take that every day. And question. What was the dose of luteolin that you recommended? 100 milligrams a day. 100 milligrams a day. So I, I take that almost every day. Uh, I don't always take the same thing every day, but that's certainly in either. my stack. I don't either. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was giving a talk recently. And they talked about full, you had to do your disclosures because it was a continuing medical education talk. And I had to indicate I was a, uh, an advisor to a certain CGM company and whatever. And then I, I said, and another disclosure, I don't take the same supplements every day. And another disclosure is uh, on occasion I've eaten gluten and I'm still here. So. <laughs> <laughs> and another disclosure, my wife and I binge watch shows sometimes on Netflix, truth be known. And yeah, believe it or not, yes, we're still here. But I All right, Dr. Perlmutter, what's your favorite show? You have to tell us that. Suits. Suits, all right. Hands down. Uh, and the problem is we're at season eight at the end. We're, oh, we know we're at the end. Anyway, uh, Meghan Markle has probably already met uh, Prince Harry, so I think she had to drop out of the rotation, so we know we're near the end. Anyhow, um, I, I mentioned a moment ago that this really critical enzyme called fructokinase is yeah. what is needed for fructose to do its dirty work, for fructose to become uric acid and signal the body to really disrupt its metabolism. Uric acid enhances this enzyme, fructokinase, so it stimulates even more and more of its own production. And we rarely see in physiology a situation where something feeding back actually makes itself even more active. Normally, we have what's called feedback inhibition, like we see with insulin regulating blood sugar. In this case, it, it's so desperately important for our survival that uric acid amplify itself uh, so Gosh, uh, now that we know that, man, oh man, knowing what your uric acid level is, taking the quercetin, cutting your fructose, taking the luteolin, uh, restorative sleep, get uh, some uh, monitoring device. I use an aura ring. I'm not on their board. I'm just saying I do. Uh, and it's very helpful. Know how well you're sleeping uh, and, and really get in touch with your uric acid level and finally take that last edge off uh, in terms of your metabolic challenges. I, I love it. Um, I just did a little quick sleuthing as we were going through this. I'm looking at probiotics, and it looks like there are some species of Lactobacillus plantarum, which is a common probiotic. In fact, you probably use plantarum in some of the things that you've created. All of the things I create. All the things you created. And there are specific subspecies that grow on buffalo milk, which is probably similar to yak milk, but it's grass-fed, it has to be. So likely from um, grass-fed milk would be the same from cows or cassava or sweet potato, right? And cassava and sweet potato are generally lower toxin carbs that I recommend. I think those are ones that you would also recommend that don't have any fructose in them, right? Uh, hard to say. I would say uh, probably what you're saying is true, but you know, fructose in trace amounts is seen in a, a lot of vegetables, though the name fructose comes from fruit sugar. 
And yeah. I, I want to be clear, uh, we're not saying in any way, the, the data does not indicate that we shouldn't be eating fruit. You know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, five apples a day and the doctor you will pay. Meaning, you know, if you want to have an apple, go for it. Have an apple or two, make sure, eat the skin. Uh, cherries are uh, actually mm -hmm. a great idea uh, for people who want to control. That's, if you look at the, the uh, O on drop acid, that's a, book, yeah. that's a cherry and falling from the sky. The indication there is that it's bringing down your uric acid. So tart cherry has been used as gout therapy for, for decades. And why? Because it works. It does lower uric acid, specifically targets that uh, enzymes, anthine oxidase, that's involved in the creation uh, of uric acid. I think the other thing I want to just get back to just a moment is the notion that not drinking enough water. You know, grandma said or mom said, you got to drink a lot of water. They said a lot of stuff to us. And uh, they always said breakfast was the important meal of the day, most important. I, but I think, you know, nowadays it's not necessarily what mom told us to eat. But I think the bigger story is when do you break your fast in the day? But, but having said that, uh, you know, the idea of, of eating some fruit is uh, appropriate. Uh, you know, an apple has in it some bioflavonoids that are helpful at, uh, in reducing uric acid formation, has vitamin C, uh, which helps us excrete uric acid, and it's got uh, fiber that slows our absorption of fructose so the liver can handle it. We're not going to spill it over into the intestine where we then absorb it and, you know, you know, again, pave the way for activating uric acid. So, um, you know, by all means, fruit is still very much on the table. Um, but again, there is nothing uh, really salu uh, salubrious about uh, drinking a 16 ounce glass of fruit juice. It may as well be a Coke. Well said. And if, when people give that stuff to kids, it even drives me crazy or like, kids don't need that it's just bad for them and kids can drink water right they have this weird thing called thirst <laughs> <laughs> that regulates how much water they drink yeah who, knew? Totally, who would have thought right it's a great now, thing to ask somebody when were you last thirsty and when were you last hungry that's one of the great things about fasting for example is you 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 get in touch with being hungry again and that does two things yeah you know what it, it feels like to think that you need to eat uh a and b you, be, you know, hunger sort of, uh, for me anyway, uh, triggers gratitude because we do have food and we have food whenever we want food and good food at that. So you can reestablish a relationship with that sense of gratitude by fasting as well. Uh, that, uh, that is something that certainly is in alignment um, between the stuff that, that, we, that we both teach and it, it's interesting that your background is neurology as well. So all of this, you look at the metabolism because you're also looking at the nervous system and the brain. What do we know about uric acid and uh, lining of the nerves, myelination, neurotransmitters, things like that? Well, we're just beginning to understand that uh, this process that we're talking about uh, is clearly uh, affecting the brain. Uh, and, you know, the fact that it would should not be a surprise for people like you and me, where we've known that metabolic issues have been correlated to declining brain functionality right now and also increasing our risk for things like Alzheimer's in the future. We see strong correlations between excess uh, body fat, high BMI, and risk for Alzheimer's, incredible correlations between even subtle elevations of blood sugar and certainly the hemoglobin A1C and dementia risk. Uh, hypertension has been talked about as an Alzheimer's risk uh, issue for many, many years. And that said, then it shouldn't be surprising that uric acid uh, is related to all of those things and therefore clearly related to Alzheimer's risk. Having said that, let me go back to what is called the polyol pathway. That is the body's ability to convert glucose into fructose. Because a recent, and there, there's several things that will do that. We talked about dehydration. Serum sodium goes up, activates an enzyme, aldose reductase. That turns your blood sugar into fructose because it's a survival mechanism. So that happens in the brain. The brain can convert glucose into fructose and therefore lead to elevations of uric acid that will threaten mitochondrial function. Alzheimer's is, a, is at its core a mitochondrial disease where the brain cell's uh, ability to make energy, which is the job of the mitochondria, 
declines. And these brain cells just basically stop working because they run out of the ability to use fuel. First fuel that they can't use is glucose. That's why there are studies by one gentleman in New Zealand, Matthew Phillips, putting Alzheimer's patients on a crazy diet, diet called a ketogenic diet, giving the brain cells an alternative fuel, and he's demonstrating improvement in cognitive function in patients with moderate stage Alzheimer's disease. I interviewed him on my podcast. His name is Matthew Phillips. My point being, though, that the, the really seminal event seems to be a bioenergetic crisis in the brain of the yep. Alzheimer's patient. Yep, and it's all mitochondria. Is, pardon me? <laughs> it's all mitochondria. Like, how it, good are you at combining energy, air and food? Right? And, and one recent study <clears throat> demonstrated that, you know, we, we think the brain is starved for glucose, but the actual glucose within the brain, but not in the cell, is as much as fivefold higher in certain parts of the, of the Alzheimer's brain, the areas that are most involved, the temporal parietal regions, the memory center called the hippocampus, there's actually a backlog of glucose. Well, where does it go? What does it do? Well, it activates this polyol pathway and gets turned into fructose. Fructose is an alarm signal. It makes uric acid. Uric acid is toxic intracellularly to the mitochondria. Why? Because it wants to slow down the, the metabolism in the rest of the body to conserve energy, but it's detrimental to the brain. And the initial event here is, again, insulin resistance. So however we get there, we're ultimately going to play this forward by through the mechanism of fructose and then uric acid. So getting back to conversations you and I have, have had for years, we really need to do everything we can not to become insulin resistant because the brain desperately depends on the function of this hormone, insulin, uh, to allow it to get blood sugar not only into the brain, but also uh, allow uh, blood sugar to do what it does uh, in brain cells. Insulin in the brain is more than just a glucose story, more than a sugar story. Insulin is actually a trophic, uh, nutritious chemical for brain cells. It's the miracle. It's the fertilizer. If you want to grow brain cells in the Petri dish, you add insulin. So we, we tend to lock into our notions of, oh, insulin drives the blood sugar uh, into the cell. What's the next question? No, no, we still need to unpack insulin. It does a lot of other things in, in the body. It signals the body to make fat, uh, as an example. So all this stuff's coming together. Uh, and the incredible role that uric acid is playing in insulin resistance is really breathtaking. Uric acid is the signal telling our bodies to become insulin resistant and how it does it. One of the important mechanisms is, and I'm getting deep into the weeds, but I know that uh, your, your guys are probably loving this. Uric acid, when it's elevated, shuts down the production and functionality of something called nitric oxide in the blood vessel. It, that it, is turns, it turns out everyone in the audience knows about nitric oxide because we did a couple episodes and people just want to talk about erections just over and over. Well, so look, that, that's got to be Elevated uric acid uh, is associated with a 34% increased risk of erectile dysfunction. There you go, Why? guys. See, because <laughs> uric acid uh, facilitates nitric oxide. We need nitric oxide. So blood vessels, not just in the penis, but in the that supply the heart and the kidneys and the liver and the brain. The brain yeah. We need to supply our organs. When we can't uh, keep nitric oxide functioning, we increase our risk. I mentioned earlier of death from stroke, 35% increased risk when uric acid is, is elevated. So how does Viagra, Sildenafil, work? It increases how nitric oxide is able to do its job and allow blood vessels to dilate. That's what you need for an erection. And two very large studies came out just last month demonstrating a 70% reduction in Alzheimer's risk in men who regularly use Viagra. Now, I'm not promoting Viagra as a uh, an anti-Alzheimer's regimen. This was a study looking at uh, medical records of more than a million men. Uh, but what I am saying is we have to keep nitric oxide working. And when we now recognize that uric acid does its dirty work by compromising nitric oxide, you're darn right you want to get your uric acid levels down. 
Uh, wow. Th- this really is it. a smoking gun behind almost all of the things that people are looking to reduce through biohacking, the stuff that makes you not live longer. And I, I'm i actually experimenting with taking between a 10% and a 25% dose of sildalafil, basically the a Cialis, um, in order to enhance nitric oxide activity after all the the studies on uh on Alzheimer's disease and whatnot. Uh, The reason being that when I take the normal things that people say should work like beetroot, it tends to go down the the inducible NOS pathway, which creates peroxynitrite, which is highly inflammatory. Well said, absolutely. If beets make you feel like shit, it's okay, don't eat them. Uh, Not to mention the other oxalic acid problem, which leads me to my next question. Oxalic acid versus uric acid and gout. Talk to me about what you know. Well, gout is not just a a disease caused by high uric acid levels. There are plenty of people walking around with with uric acid levels of uh, ten or eleven. I I spoke with somebody just yesterday had a uric acid level uh, that varies between ten and eleven. He does not have gout, um, but uh, you know oxalic acid and uric acid are are far more relevant as it relates to kidney stones. Another issue that is seen uh, as a consequence of having well in conjunction with having Genetic predisposition, certain SNPs, as well as elevated uric acid and uh, oxalic acid as well. Uh, There's certainly a lot of literature uh, indicating that uh, elevated oxalic acid can have far more wide-reaching effects within the body in terms of inflammation. Uh, One uh, thing that's commonly talked about as it relates to oxalic acid is something called vulvodynia, which is basically vaginal pain, sometimes to the extent that uh, intercourse is impossible. Uh, so a low oxalate diet might be helpful for that. But you know, I think it's important, even as we re- relate back to gout, there are other factors uh, that are involved, like hydration, especially as it relates to kidney stones. Uh, I want to get back just a moment to the Viagra question uh, yep. or commentary or discussion. as Sure. Well. And that is, there is a, a list of pharmaceuticals that are associated with pretty significant elevation of the uric acid. And unfortunately, Viagra sildenafil is on that list. Interesting. So I would say as you tinker with things and watch your uric acid level, that might be one of the variables you should think of. And let's just, for the fun of it, talk about a few others. Uh, A couple of drugs that are used to treat high blood pressure, like the beta blockers and the water pills, the diuretics, are associated with, are shown to raise uric acid levels. So even though you're treating your high blood pressure, you may be raising your uric acid <laughs> that may raise your blood pressure further. I wonder okay. who might know that. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, aspirin, uh, testosterone, and I think one of the biggest players is uh, a group of uh, drugs that are called proton pump inhibiting drugs. These are the um, omeprazole type over-the-counter and prescription drugs, acid, PPI, uh, acid blocking drugs that uh, Larry the Cable Guy would have everyone believe they need to take. And these are drugs taken by 15 million Americans and are associated with at least a twofold increase risk, increased risk of Alzheimer's and stroke. So uh, having said that, um, one of the things to consider is that these drugs increase uric acid levels. So just, you know, we, we obviously have a list of all the drugs uh, in Theophylline is another one in the book uh, for people to look at. One other thing I will mention is xylitol, a sugar alcohol that's often yeah. found. Uh, and sorbitol would be one to avoid as well in terms of choosing an artificial sweetener if that's something somebody feels like he or she has to do. Let's talk more about xylitol because I've been a general fan of it because of the the benefits in nasal cleaning from products like Clear. Uh, the reduction of cavities and even increases in bone density in women from xylitol without negative impacts on gut bacteria for most people once they get used to it. But you've got some new evidence about what xylitol does for for uric acid levels. Tell me about that. So again, it is uh, clearly associated uh, of all of those uh, sugar alcohols with uh, increased gout. Uh, sorry, increased uric acid uh, levels. So. You know, again, I'm not dead set against it as I'm not dead set against eating liver or kidneys, whatever it may be, but it's something, you know, we've put out a lot of information and uh, going back to the top five, the top three are fructose. Uh, So, um, but having said that, you know, it really depends on now 
for everyone watching, what is your uric acid level? And I will say that for most people, determining your uric acid might be as simple as picking up your phone and calling your doctor because people who get annual blood work, again, it's frequently included. And unfortunately, what might happen is you call your doctor and say, hey, I know I had blood work four months ago. What was my uric acid? And she will get back to you that, oh, it was normal. Please remember that that's not a good enough answer for any of you for two reasons. Number one, who wants to be normal these days? We want to be optimal. And number two, the normal, so-called normal levels of uric acid are derived from data that deals with gout, meaning seven or above, seven milligrams per deciliter or above is certainly associated with increased risk of gout, but it's the level in your blood above which uh, this uric acid will start to crystallize. And understand as a, as a parenthetic here, that it'll, it, these crystals are observed in the, in your heart arteries and your prostate, uh, not just in the joint of your uh, big toe. So this is something that's going on within your body. But again, that magic number of seven is not ideal. We want to keep our, our uric acid levels at 5.5 or lower because it's at 5.5 that, you know, the more than 400 references that we reviewed to write this book um, uh, which are at the most of them in the back of the book, it's above 5.5 that we start to see a pretty steep increased risk for, you know, the things that we're worried about, the metabolic derangements that are so fundamental uh, for us to rein in as it relates to living a long and healthy life and prosper. The, this is a phenomenal body of knowledge that you shared here. And part of your book, Drop Acid, is something called the Love LUV, Lower Uric Values Diet. Uh, which I wanted to run a, through a couple things uh, with you there. Um, mostly plant-based foods, but y you know that grass-fed meat has all sorts of benefits. We've talked about this other that's times. Cool. That's why it's included. It, it, it's included. So when you eat meat, it's grass-fed. And how much protein per day are we talking about? Well, it uh, you know it varies, of course, on a person's um, body mass to start off with and their activity. Are they weight training, et cetera? But if you're going to be eating meat, I would say six to eight ounces would be plenty. Six to eight ounces a day. Yep. Okay, and got that it. Would be, you know, the size of maybe a, a deck of cards or perhaps a little bit more. So, uh, do I eat meat? You bet. I uh, do. I yeah, I've eat seen meat? you do it. <laughs> you know, you've seen me do it. I've eaten your pigs, <laughs> right? <laughs> and enjoyed every bite. Uh, but you know, I I like the notion of at least one meal a day being uh, entirely plant based. And um, I, I, the main reason it's not to, to stay away from meat, uh, for me, uh, it's to make sure I'm getting enough fiber, make sure I'm getting enough of all the great things, the bioflavonoids, the vitamins and minerals that, that organic vegetables are giving me. And so uh, it's not a question of steering away from me, uh, meat, uh, especially in recent years. It's just steering myself towards eating more and more vegetables because they're so important for, you know, just in and of themselves, but also how they're nurturing and uh, changing the expression of our gut bacteria, for example. Uh, no, I, I completely agree with your perspective there. My typical breakfast is coffee <laughs> with prebiotic fiber. Can't well, it's actually, it's my new coffee that's coming out here. I'm experimenting in another few weeks after we record this, I should be launching my brand new different coffee from what I've done in the past. Okay. But there will, uh, there'll be some coffee, there'll be some prebiotic fiber. So I'm getting tons more fiber than most people get just in my breakfast and some fat, you know, MCTs and, and butter and, and whatnot. Um, and you could call that a meal. It's not raising my insulin or my blood sugar at all. And because there's no protein, it's not raising mTOR. I imagine it's lowering, if anything, my uric acid because it's got coffee and nothing that raises it. Um, and so that's very much in alignment with the love diet, I think, right? Yeah, I would say. And, uh, you know, throughout the, the love diet, we, you know, we have 40 recipes in the book. We feature some of our hero ingredients. We, for example, I mentioned earlier cherries, uh, red onions, for example. Uh, Lee's uh, made a almond cherry loaf uh, yesterday uh, that was phenomenal. And so now we're eating cherries mixed with almond flour. Uh, it was, it was really quite wonderful. That recipe is in the book. One of my favorites as well. 
Wow. Okay. Um, that sounds amazing. And the the one area where we probably differ a little bit, in fact, I, I'm going to support 100% um, lowering, um, not eating organ meats if you are above seven, right? But the benefits of organ meats are so high for for minerals and for unusual forms of B vitamins that are not on the standard list and all these other things. It feels like an ounce of liver for someone with levels around 5.5 who doesn't eat a lot of fructose, who doesn't drink a lot of alcohol probably the benefits outweigh the risks, but if your job is to I lower would, stuff, you I should quit completely, it. Completely. Uh, we've not found a place yet that, that we uh, disagree because I would okay. agree with that. Um, and again, uh, you know, it's a question of what does each individual's uric acid tolerate in terms of where they are? And I would say that in most people, if that's their choice, that they're going to get away with it. Again, you know, what's the average uh, uric acid level was 3.5 in the 1920s. That was wow. before, you know, the, the development of the technology from the University of, of Oklahoma, Dr. Richard Marshall in 1958 for making high fructose corn syrup. That's That was the, the nail in the coffin right there. So, I, you know, I think that you and I would definitely uh, still be on the same page that if people want to eat a venison, organ meats, anchovies, sardines, uh, you know, muscles, scallops, that they're going to get away with it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, uh, you just, again, have to see where you are and how these things are treating you, how the offsets are working. What are the offsets? Things like quercetin, things like luteolin, very important. I have here the uh, you assure meter that you gave me. I don't know how this Lancet works, but you're supposed to test in the morning when you first wake up, right? Are we going live with your with your measurement? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to prick my finger. I have not tried this yet. I've been saving it for the show. Of course, I don't know how this uh, Lancet thing works, so i got to figure it out. What I do is I, st I, I stick it right under my thumbnail. I, I squeeze my my thumb and just drive it in under my thumbnail. How do you for cock it, reason. though? Pardon me? I don't, how do you cock this thing? I don't know this kind of oh, Lancet. I, I don't use the automatic thing. I just stick the Lancet into my... All right, I'll do that. So, guys, if you've never done this before, this is a little Lancet. You... Pull the. That's the one I use. Pull it off and stick it under your thumbnail, off. all the way in. Under your thumbnail, you don't. I just do it on the edge. Not you under, just... but at the level of the thumbnail, into the meat of your thumb. Like, like right I'm about. I'm telling right you, there. that's the best place for me. All right, I'm going to get my test strip ready before I stick myself. And yeah, I should wipe myself with alcohol, but I'm going to live dangerously. What do you think? Am I going to die? <laughs> We're watching Dave Asprey on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now I'm opening up a test strip here. Uh, very poorly opening it, by the way. There we go. And with test strips, you don't want to touch the end that goes in the meter. So I think that's I opened right. That part and the little notchy thing goes up. See that? Okay. So now I'm going to stick my finger here. Oh, no. Put the thumb. test strip in the machine first. Oh, you put it in the machine first. That's interesting. Yep. It's different than the other ones. All right. So it's in the machine. Machine's beeping and doing stuff. Good. And it's giving me a code. So I'm going to stick my finger here. There. I'm going to see it's all the way in. I'm going to pull it out. And look, there's blood. Ah. <laughs> Is it going that little notch on the side or down here? I don't know. It's used on this. the side of the, uh, of the test strip. Right there. Oh, it's beeping. How long does it take? 10 seconds. All right. It's beeping. Meanwhile, I'm going to increase my heme levels. I, uh. Sucked on my finger. Was that was that sanitary? Am I going to die? No, I think not. <laughs> Let the dog lick it. <laughs> All the medical people from the Upgrade Collective are like, oh, my God. They were supposed to have a Band-Aid on there. Down to one countdown. So I had a bunch of protein this morning, some coffee. 9.4. That's not good. So is that because I'm testing in the middle of the day? Do I need to do this when I wake up to get a real reading? Yeah, I, I would test first thing in the morning uh, like you would do blood sugar. That that's a high measurement, but I I'd like you'll email me tomorrow and let me know what you are first thing in the morning. Okay, good uh, deal. If you fast, it's going to go up a bit. Uh, if you're deeply keto, it's going to go up. Uh, keep that in mind. Those are I'm, good things to do. Keto is good. Fasting is good. You will net uh, an improvement on your uric acid in the longer run. Uh, but just be aware that if you're fasting, it's going to be up a little bit. Or if you're into ketosis, it's going to be up a little bit. I'm definitely in ketosis and I'm fasting right now, so that could be part of it. Um, yeah, but we'll we'll see what happens. And so let's see what you are tomorrow morning, and then okay. you'll uh, text me or email me. We'll take it from there. That's a I'll high do number. That. And what does uh, baking soda or potassium 
the potassium equivalent of that, what does that do uh, for uric acid levels, if anything? It should have no effect. I mean, one thing uh, is that um, is that uh, you can uh, change your uric acid excretion uh, based upon uh, certain inputs. We know that coffee will do it, but it's not the caffeine, for example. It's probably the bio, uh, the polyphenols, uh, bioflavonoids, and uh, perhaps the caffeic acid uniquely. Um, but uh, generally, things that may cause you to diurese or lose a lot of uh, fluid might actually net an increase of your uric acid. Got it. So my experiment with low-dose uh, Cialis for nitric oxide could be contributing but I don't eat enough fructose to do anything to this, and I don't drink alcohol, and I don't. I take about an ounce of liver a day, um, so that's unlikely to crank my number up that much. It's probably pharmaceutical. I do take luteolin and uh, quercetin most days as well. Interesting. Yeah, so you have a lot of variables here. Um, okay. Uh, oh, well, we'll most do tomorrow morning and find out. Yeah, average in America is about six point zero. Women a little bit lower. Okay. And, uh, but I want to make sure that we get your, you, let's it's been, like probably all be fine the in the morning. Do. Like okay. all well, the things you do for yourself, we're going to get your uric acid level down. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get a proper test first to see if it's really elevated or if it's something that's just throughout the day. How long does it take? Let's say someone wants to drop it by point. Can they do that in a day? Is it in two weeks? Is oh, it a it, month? It can happen within a couple of days. Yep. Okay. I mean, I, I, I quoted one study where just five, you know, who, who wouldn't take uh question anyway? But that was an 8% drop in just two weeks. By just doing that, that was the only variable, was adding in the quercetin. Okay, got No dietary it. change whatsoever. And that's why having a meter is a good thing. And by the way, you and I don't have any relationship with the meter company, right? We're just talking about a, a cheap way to measure it? Uh, yeah, I, I, on my website, uh, hopefully I will have a discount for people uh, who buy that meter, uh, but... You know, I, I called these people and said, hey, I'm going to talk about your meter in my book and on public television, so you better put your seatbelts on. So uh, th they're aware of all this information because this is a, a uric acid meter that was only available for people or bought for people who thought they needed to know it because of gout. And now that we know um, about the metabolic issues, and I will tell you, there are various uric acid meters uh, on the, that you can find on Amazon. Uh, I have not, this is the only one I've tried, but uh, I would suspect the others are probably uh, worthwhile as well. They're all FDA approved for whatever that's worth. Uh, I don't know that they are. Uh, oh, really? I know this one okay. is. This one does have FDA approval. I can't, t I haven't really investigated the other yeah. ones. That they, they would be um, taken off the market very quickly by the FDA if they weren't approved because there's a, a tra yeah, trade protection. Yeah, I, I hear you, there. but uh, yeah. I. I, Let's I just, verify. I, I'd love to You're see right. it in writing, you know? I, I agree. I, I like your physician's level of caution versus the biohacker's level of, eh, it's probably good. <laughs> Abandon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, final question for you, David. That has nothing to do with uric acid, I don't okay. think. Okay. You've been working on really powerful books um, and just changing the, the way we think about the, these things for much longer than I have. But I know you personally, and you still have this... I'm going to call it childlike curiosity. Like you get excited by stuff, you're curious about it. You go, oh, look at this. And then you go figure it out. How, let me put it this way. What do you do to maintain that level of interest and curiosity and just mental youthfulness that you have? Because I see it every time I talk to you. I don't know that I do anything to maintain it, um, except that I cater to it. Uh, I, I, just am interested in how things work, uh, how the human body works, metabolism works. What are the underlying causes of our maladies? I, I, that interest comes from being a, a physician. Um, and I, I, I've always wanted just to unravel things. And I thought your question was going to be, what's next? And that's always a tough one. But I, I will say that um, I heard a podcast uh, a couple of years ago when I was jogging. And um, about uric acid metabolism, that lit me up. That was uh, that. That was it because it really uh, filled a lot of uh, empty spaces in my understanding of what you know of metabolism. And I think the biggest uh, part for me was I have been fascinated my entire life since at being a teenager with the fact that we we have this ancient uh, physiology that we have a you know this 
hunter gatherer or even before physiology, and that it's mismatched to our current uh, environment. And things, uh, when I look at things through that lens, it's so uh, fascinating and revealing. Uh, you know, because we we always pigeonhole insulin resistance bad, excess body weight bad, hypertension bad, but all of that is contextual, isn't it? It's in the context of our modern world. Those were powerful survival tools that we had as humans until yesterday. So that is, I think, uh, very exciting. Uh, but I think it's, you know, I've always been interested in how things work. It's why I, okay. it's why I live on a boat for four months because things are inevitably going to break and I'm going to have to fix them. And I like that. Most of the time. <laughs> it, it's that desire to know how things work. Well, I, I, we, we definitely share that. I was pretty sure that you were going to say you, you kept your enthusiasm because you drop acid, uh, but you didn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't deny it either, though. <laughs> oh, fair point. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask because you probably wouldn't be able to answer, but I do appreciate your work in the world. Dr. Perlmutter, thank you for your new book, Drop Acid. You're bringing some really serious, important knowledge about core metabolism with a cheap and easy to follow biomarker and some clear recommendations. Don't eat fructose. There you go. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. If you like today's episode, you know what to do. Go to drperlmutter.com and check out the new book, Drop Acid. If you decide to read the book, you are a bad person if you don't leave a review for him or any other author, just like you'd tip a barista. It's the same thing. You have to do that. And if you thought this was a fun interview, imagine if you were here in the Upgrade Collective, sitting here with a bunch of other people on video, looking at me, hearing this live asking questions, influencing what I say, what I do. You can do that along with getting a class on every book I've written, along with weekly calls with me and my coaching team. So you can really be in a community of people who care about you. You can go to either daveasprey.com or go to Our Upgrade Collective and sign up to be part of my mentorship group. It's a ton of fun. Literally a third of the questions that I just asked Dr. Perlmutter came from the Upgrade Collective, including that joke about dropping acid at the end. That was Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. See you all soon. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey.